Welcome back to Cinematic Excrement, ladies and gentlemen. At long last, it's time for the conclusion to our look at the history of the Fantastic Four on film. When we last left our heroes in Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer, they had just defeated Doctor Doom yet again after the U.S. Army foolishly put their trust in him. And the Silver Surfer finally realized, hey, I've had the power to stop Galactus all along. Maybe I should get on that. And he kamikaze the giant space anus into oblivion. So with the planet saved and Reed and Sue finally tying the knot, what would be next for our family of heroes? Well, nothing, I'm afraid. While the cast signed a three-picture deal and director Tim Story expressed interest in doing a third film, Rise of the Silver Surfer did not make as much money at the box office as 20th Century Fox had hoped. And rather than throw their resources at a third film that would almost certainly be a money sink, they decided to flip the reboot switch and start over. And while rebooting the franchise so soon might seem a bit hasty, maybe it was the right call. While the Tim Story movies had their moments, they were heavily flawed and, quite frankly, Marvel's first family deserved better. And with the superhero movie landscape drastically changing thanks largely to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, perhaps it was time to take things in a different direction. A new cast and a new vision could be just the shot in the arm the Fantastic Four needed. And so, with director Josh Trank at the helm, fresh off his success with Chronicle, another movie about people who suddenly gain superpowers, Fox gave us 2015's Fantastic Four, stylized as Fantforstic for reasons that are beyond me. And to call it a disaster would be an understatement. It currently sits at 9% on Rotten Tomatoes, the worst rating ever for a Marvel movie. It won three Razzies, Worst Director, Worst Remake Ripoff or Sequel, and tied with Fifty Shades of Grey for Worst Picture. Personally, I'm not quite sure if it deserves that last one, but it was pretty bad. The signs of Fantforstic, and yes, I'm going to keep calling it that, being a disaster were evident long before the movie was even released. There were reports of Trank constantly butting heads with studio executives during filming, treating the cast and crew like shit, not showing up to the set on time, not being sober when he did show up, and overall being a fantastic asshole. And this was only the second movie he directed. I've heard of Hollywood getting to people, but usually it at least takes a few years. With Trank, it damn near happened overnight. I have not seen anyone rise to fame and fortune and self-destruct this quickly since Troy Duffy. Mind you, that does not mean the studio was blameless for this train wreck of a film, and may have been the reason why Trank went off the rails. Fox and Trank were butting heads before principal photography even started. Reportedly, the studio kept forcing Trank to change the script throughout production, the budget they gave Trank was much lower than what they initially promised, and they even hired a prominent special effects expert for the film, and then fired him without telling Trank about it. And when production wrapped on the film, the powers that be at Fox were so unhappy with the finished product that they ordered massive reshoots, including the film's climax. Now, just because a movie goes through reshoots does not automatically mean it's going to suck. Lots of movies go through reshoots. The Lord of the Rings movies went through reshoots, and they're fucking amazing. But the amount of effort they put into the reshoots is rather telling. Kate Mara, who played Susan Storm, had already changed her hairstyle after production wrapped, so for the reshoots, she had to wear a wig. And they didn't even try to match her hair color in the rest of the film. This does make it pretty easy to tell which parts of the film were reshoots. Just look for the wig. No, that's not it. No, that's still her natural hair. Oh, there it is. There's that piece of shit discount wig from the spirit store. This movie cost $120 million to make. You'd think they could have spent a few more bucks on a decent wig. And then, after the reshoots wrapped, the studio basically delivered the ultimate fuck you to Trank by locking him out of the editing room and finishing the theatrical cut of the film without him. Now, even if all of this is true, that does not excuse Trank's behavior on set. I don't care if the studio was making your life hell, that is no reason to take it out on the cast and crew. Lots of directors have had clashes with producers and studio executives. It's why Edgar Wright left Ant-Man, for example. But there's a right way and a wrong way to handle that. Even if you have an explanation for being an asshole, you're still being an asshole. Now, while all of this was going on, Trank and the studio were publicly doing their best to dispel any rumors of behind-the-scenes unrest and assured everyone that everything was just fine. Even as news surfaced that Trank would no longer be directing a standalone Star Wars movie that he was previously attached to. Whether he quit voluntarily or was fired depends on who you ask. 
But the day before Fant Forstick hit theaters and the early critical response was, shall we say, less than flattering, Trank seemingly dropped the charade when he, or at least someone with access to his Twitter account, tweeted this. A year ago, I had a fantastic version of this, and it would have received great reviews. You'll probably never see it. That's reality, though. The tweet was quickly deleted, but what happens on the internet stays on the internet. Tweets can be deleted, but screenshots are forever. So clearly Josh Trank has disowned the theatrical cut of Fan Stick, and I can't say I blame him for doing so. But if he had the freedom to make his vision of the Fantastic Four a reality, what would it have looked like? Well, over time, details started to leak out regarding an early draft of the script Trank worked on with writer Jeremy Slater before producer Simon Kinberg was brought in for a rewrite. Reportedly, that version of the script actually resembled an MCU movie in tone, and seems like it would have been a lot of fun. But it was also quite bloated. In addition to Doctor Doom, the Fantastic Four would have also faced off against Galactus, who makes Doom his herald, and Doctor Harvey Elder, who becomes the Mole Man. And if Spider-Man 3 taught us anything, it's that cramming too many villains into your movie can make it feel a bit unfocused. Having your hero sport an emo haircut and dance around like an idiot doesn't help either, but I digress. The original script also called for some pretty elaborate set pieces and action sequences, which would have been very costly to produce, so I can understand why Kinberg was brought in to trim the fat. Unfortunately, the end result was more craptastic than fantastic. The story is fairly similar to the Fantastic Four origin story that you've already heard me talk about twice, though Trank and company did at least try to put their own spin on it. It starts with a young Reed Richards and Ben Grimm performing science experiments in Ben's garage, even though they are discouraged from doing so by practically everyone because reasons. The assignment was to pick a real career in the real world. Scientist is not a real career. Young Reed is trying to build the world's first teleporter, which is apparently powered by a stack of Nintendo 64s. Okay, time the fuck out. Number one, how does that work? And number two, where the hell did he get all those? It's quite a collection, I'm impressed. By the time they get to high school, Reed and Ben, played respectively by Miles Teller and Jamie Bell, have built a better teleporter that does not involve Nintendo 64s. I can only assume this one is powered by GameCubes. The teachers still tell them to get stuffed because sadly, much like Rise of the Silver Surfer, this is the kind of movie where everyone is stupid. But Reed does attract attention from one person in this movie who has two brain cells to rub together. The only one, really. Meet Dr. Franklin Storm, played by Reg E. Cathy, father of Johnny Storm, played by Michael B. Jordan, and Susan Storm, played by Kate Mara. She's adopted. Obviously. And let's just get this out of the way right now. Yes, Johnny Storm in this movie is black. And according to some people on the internet, most of whom are probably voting Trump, this is the worst thing to have happened in the history of ever. But, 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 but he was white in the comics and now he's b b b black? No! No! This will ruin everything for some reason! You know, last I checked, making Nick Fury black did not ruin the Avengers. And making Catwoman black didn't ruin Catwoman. Plenty of other things ruined that movie, but casting Halle Berry was not the problem. So Dr. Storm offers Reed a scholarship to some institution known as the Baxter Foundation, but Ben gets nothing even though he helped Reed build the damn thing. Yeah, don't ask me to explain that one. And he gets to work on making a bigger version of the teleporter with Sue, Johnny, and this guy. Believe it or not, this antisocial basement dwelling nihilist is Victor Von Doom, played by Toby Kebbell. And after seeing this guy on screen for just a few seconds, I am begging for the return of Joseph Culp from the Roger Corman movie. Sure, that interpretation of the character was very silly and over the top, but at least he was fun. This guy is just a cynical douchebag. People running the earth are the same ones running into the ground, so maybe it deserves what it's got coming to it. Dr. Doom over here. Ha ha! Shut up, Sue. There are no greater minds than the ones in this room. Dear God, I hope that's not true. By the way, the initial plan was to change Victor's last name to Domashev or something like that. But during the reshoots, they changed their minds and went back to calling him Victor Von Doom. Believe it or not, I think they made the right call. Sure, Victor Von Doom is a very silly name, but keep in mind, the character is not American. Just like in the comics, the character is from the fictional European country of Latveria. 
perhaps in Latveria, Von Doom is a perfectly normal name. It's really not all that uncommon for a name in one country to sound far sillier than it actually is in another country's native tongue. Case in point, in Austria they have a town called Fucking. It's spelled exactly how you think it is. So anyway, Reed, Sue, Victor, and Johnny, the latter of which is the only person in this movie who has anything resembling a personality, get to work on the teleporter through the power of a science montage. And why is it so dark in this room? They're doing scientific experiments and manufacturing. I was under the impression that both of those things required well-lit environments. Come to think of it, the entire movie is pretty dark. Most of it takes place either at night or in these dimly lit rooms, and they have that same goddamn washed out color palette as Man of Steel. Why do they keep doing this shit? Why are so many filmmakers nowadays afraid of color? Is it really too much to ask that I get a superhero movie that doesn't look like the negative was left out in the sun? Anyway, despite their OSHA-violating working conditions, they successfully teleport a terrible CGI monkey, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes this is not, to a place they're calling Planet Zero, and our heroes naturally assume they'll be the next to go. But the people in charge quickly shut them down since they want to get NASA involved. Which seems like a good idea, actually. But as Reed, Johnny, and Victor get drunk that night, they decide the suits can go fuck themselves and they're going to Planet Zero whether they like it or not. Getting hammered and using dangerous experimental equipment without supervision. Our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. But there's room for four in the teleporter, so naturally they invite Ben. Sure, he's not a student and didn't work on this version of the teleporter, but he's Reed's friend, so that's good enough, right? I mean, they could bring Sue along, but why on earth would they do that? I mean, she's a girl. You don't want her to get her cooties all over Planet Zero. Ew. And to cut a long story short, everything goes horribly wrong and Victor is seemingly killed. Wait, wait, wait. You're telling me a bunch of college kids got drunk and said, Hey, let's take the interdimensional teleporter out for a joyride. And it didn't end well? What are the fucking odds? Sue manages to bring them back, but not without severe consequences. When they come to, Johnny's body is in flames, Ben has become a giant rock monster, and Reed's body is stretching to ridiculous proportions. And the returning teleporter lets out a shockwave that also affects Sue, making her phase in and out of the visible spectrum. And don't ask me how the shockwave covered an entire city block, yet Sue was the only one affected. I know it's the middle of the night, but they're supposed to be in New York City. I find it hard to believe there was no one else in the area. At the very least, I would expect to find some hobo sleeping on the street or some after-hours janitorial staff or security guards in one of the buildings. And there is screaming. So. Much. Screaming. So if any of you were disappointed that I'm not reviewing a horror movie for October, here you go. Here's your horror movie. You know... Maybe I'm missing something here, but aren't superhero movies supposed to be, you know, fun? This is not fun. This is just unsettling. Well, the four are taken to... Area 57? I guess Area 51 was already booked for that crappy Independence Day sequel. And now you'd expect we'd be at the part of our Fantastic Four origin story where we see how our heroes learn how to cope with their newfound superpowers. But that might actually be interesting, and we can't have that, so we're gonna skip that part and immediately flash forward to one year later. What happened during that year? <laughs> I don't know. And the movie's certainly not gonna tell you. Was this script written by monkeys? Terrible CGI monkeys? Anyway, Sue and Johnny are working with the US government to develop their powers, and Ben has been doing covert ops. Well, they call them covert ops, but I don't know how covert you can be when you're a giant rock monster. Especially when you're a naked giant rock monster. And why is the thing naked in this movie? And why doesn't he have a... uh... thing? So just before the one-year break, Reed escaped from Area 57 because government installations apparently have terrible security. Yeah, that makes sense. But once they ask Sue to help track him down, she finds him in about 90 seconds and they recapture him. So I'm not really sure what the point was. Anyway, they convince Reed to help them with version 2 of the teleporter, and my god, could these people look any more miserable? Normally when actors are enjoying themselves and are really invested in their characters, it shines through in the performance. Ain't nothing shining through here. Hell, look at the poster. All four of them just look bored. Even the thing, and he's CGI. 
And I can't really say I blame them. These characters are so boring, there's really nothing for the actors to get invested in. Combine that with Trank's behavior on set, and I wouldn't enjoy working on this movie either. Even Michael B. Jordan, talented though he may be, isn't quite on top of his game here. He looks like he's at least trying to give a shit, but deep down, he's probably just counting the days until Creed. Well, with Reed's help, they get the teleporter working, and what should they find on the other side but Victor Von Doom? Unfortunately. I think most of you have seen this by now, but in case you haven't, allow me to present Fan Force Dick's Doctor Doom. Go ahead and pause the video if you need a second to stop laughing. You good? Okay. So, I can understand wanting to do something a little different from the comics. Take an old character and put a new coat of paint on him. Sure, I'm down with that. But it looks like they applied this new coat of paint while they were blindfolded. And drunk. I mean, what the fuck am I even looking at here? He looks like C-3PO had sex with a glow stick. Inside a microwave oven. Well, now that he's back, he starts blowing people's heads up like scanners, because he apparently can do that now. Like I said, this is basically a horror movie. And then he decides to use the teleporter to destroy the Earth because... Um... Because... Because the thing about Doom is... You know what? I got nothing. I, I don't understand his motivation one bit. I mean, he briefly said something earlier about how people were destroying the Earth, so maybe they deserve to lose it, but I wouldn't expect that one line to lead to this. That's not a motivation, that's an afterthought. Anyway, our heroes follow him to Planet Zero and, get this, actually start fighting him as a team. Imagine that! They're actually starting to look like a superhero team instead of just four random schmucks with superpowers. Too bad it took almost an hour and a half to get to this point. And there wasn't really any build-up to it, it just kinda happened. And here's the real kicker. This is the movie's only action sequence. And it comes right at the very end. I haven't seen a superhero movie with so little action since... Well, since the 2005 Fantastic Four movie. That movie had only two action sequences. But that's still better than Fantastic which has one. Well, technically there was a second where Ben and a few soldiers go after Reed to bring him back to Area 57, but that sequence lasted less than a minute, so I don't count it. Oh, and this one action sequence brings up something that really pisses me off. It's quarantine! Oh yes, the thing's signature catchphrase. It's clobbering time. This movie actually provides an origin for that catchphrase, and you might want to sit down for this one. In the Fantastic universe, it's clobberin' time is what Ben's abusive older brother used to shout just before he beat the shit out of him. Hey, clobberin' time. Hey. Come on, what'd you think? What in the everlasting fuck? That's the origin of the thing's catchphrase? Now, I don't know for certain who came up with the idea. Maybe it was Josh Trank, maybe it was Simon Kinberg, maybe Jeremy Slater, maybe some uncredited writer who worked on one of the many rewrites, who knows? But I'll tell you what I do know. At some point, 20th Century Fox started meddling with the production. So how is it that in all of their meddling and all the changes that they forced upon Trank and company, no one ever looked at the origin of its clobberin' time and said, you know, Maybe this is a bad idea? So go ahead and blame the writers, blame the director, blame whoever you wish. Me, I am blaming 20th Century Fox. Because if you're going to exert creative control over a movie, at least do it right. So they defeat Doctor Doom and the world is saved and we get one last shot of Kate Mara's shitty wig, the end. Okay, so I think it goes without saying, this movie is one fantastic pile of shit. The acting is uninspired, the special effects are mediocre, and the story is just... awful. 
It's really weird because the story somehow feels slow and rushed at the same time. It takes us almost an hour to get to the point where the four get their superpowers, and then a whole lot of nothing happens until Doom returns. And then we almost immediately go into the final battle, which is also the only battle. It's like this movie follows the typical three-act structure, but the second act is just missing. And by the time the movie is over, it doesn't feel like anything was really accomplished. And for a movie about Marvel's first family, they sure don't feel like a family. These four have no chemistry whatsoever. Not that it matters much since they so rarely interact with each other. Hell, the first time all four of them share the screen is at the very end when they fight Doom. The four acting like a family is what sets them apart from other superhero teams. Take that away and, well, like I said before, you got four schmucks with superpowers. That's it. No wonder people stayed the hell away from this movie. It completely flopped at the box office and plans for a sequel were scrapped. So now the $120 million question is, what does Fox do now? Reboot the franchise yet again? I'm sure they don't want to let the rights revert back to Marvel, but at this point, maybe that's best for everyone. So far, Fox has churned out three Fantastic Four movies, all of which have been varying degrees of suck, and their most recent effort has almost certainly killed any faith the fans had in the studio. A Fox-produced Fantastic Four movie will never be trusted again. So why keep holding on to the rights? Why keep throwing away millions of dollars on movies that are all but guaranteed to not turn a profit? And just so we're clear, I'm not in favor of Marvel Studios having complete control over everything. They generally do good work, and the MCU has given us some great movies, but there's only so much one studio can do. Licensing certain properties out to Fox and Sony helps take some of the weight off and allows them to maintain the same quality standards that we've come to expect. But in the case of the Fantastic Four, Fox really needs to hand the reins back to Marvel. At this point, it just doesn't make good business sense to do otherwise. I'm not saying they have to get away from Marvel entirely. They can keep making the X-Men movies. They tend to do pretty well with those. Usually. But for Marvel's first family, it's time to go home. Well, I do believe we've covered every Fantastic Four movie to date. So how are we going to wrap this up, boys and girls? Well, I suppose we should return to the question that we asked at the beginning of this retrospective. Why have they never been able to turn the Fantastic Four into a successful film franchise? Well, unfortunately, there isn't really a simple answer. Well, okay, I guess there is, because the movies were bad. Duh. But they were all bad for different reasons. There isn't really a common denominator as far as I can see. The Roger Corman movie did its best to stay true to the spirit of the comics, but it suffers from some very silly writing and virtually no budget. The first Tim Story movie has some good mindless fun, but suffers from a lack of action, mediocre special effects, and subpar characterization. Rise of the Silver Surfer improved on its predecessor in some areas, but it has some weak acting and even weaker villains. And the Josh Trank movie... Well, shit, it basically did everything wrong. And maybe all of this is a sign. Maybe a good Fantastic Four movie just isn't in the cards. After all, not every story translates well to film. Maybe the Fantastic Four is just such a story. But I don't buy that. I think a truly good Fantastic Four movie can be done as long as they get the right people to make it and as long as they follow a few simple suggestions that I'm going to lay out right now, even though I'm pretty sure no one important will ever hear them. Number one, they're called Marvel's first family for a reason. Above all else, the Fantastic Four are supposed to feel like a family, even if they're not all biologically related. This is something I think Fan Forstick was trying to get at by making Sue the adopted brother of Johnny, but they never really went all in with it. Number two, let the superheroes act like superheroes. You'd think this would go without saying, but so far we've had two Fantastic Four movies that have been incredibly light on the superheroics. So clearly this needs to be spelled out for some people. Give us a healthy amount of action. This really shouldn't be too much to ask. Number three, take a cue from what Sony is doing with Spider-Man right now and don't retell their origin story with the next reboot. We've already heard three versions of this story. We don't need to hear it again. If you have to remind us of their origins, do it with a quick flashback and move on. Number four, none of this dark and gritty bullshit. Some superheroes work well with dark and gritty. The Fantastic Four do not. Don't even try. And finally, and this might be a controversial opinion, so brace yourselves, no Doctor Doom. There, I said it. This may sound like blasphemy, but here's the thing. 
We've had four Fantastic Four movies so far, and all of them have featured Doctor Doom as the villain in some capacity. We've been there and done that, and we really don't need to go there again. At least not right away. Think about what Christopher Nolan did when he rebooted Batman. When you think of Batman, the first villain that comes to mind is probably the Joker. But in Batman Begins, the Joker was nowhere to be found. Instead, we had Scarecrow and Ra's al Ghul. They held off on introducing the Joker until the sequel, and Batman Begins, and indeed the whole franchise, was better off for it. And I think the Fantastic Four needs to do the same thing. It's not like they don't have enough villains in their rogues gallery to choose from. The Mole Man, Namor the Submariner, the Puppet Master, the Scrolls. They have options. Use them. Let Victor sit on the sidelines for right now, because personally, I'm all doomed out. Well, maybe someday we'll get the Fantastic Four movie we've been hoping for. But today is not that day. Today, all we have is an extremely cheap B-movie that was fun but flawed, a couple of big budget movies that have their moments but are overall pretty meh, and a real piece of shit. Oh well, you can't win them all. Next time, we're going to return to the world of M. Night Shyamalan. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. Okay, so I think it goes without saying, this movie is a fantastic pile of shit. The acting is uninspired, the, the fuck, fuck, fuck. The acting is uninspired, the special effects are mediocre, and the story is just awful. Blah.